Now, the moment that you've been waiting for, um, and I hope that you are now ready to participate, you're ready with the action, with the commitment that you would like to share with us. Please, if you could stand up, state your name, state your organization, and, and tell us where you're thinking of contributing to this discussion, building the AMCAO Gender House. Um, and Honorable Minister, we are looking to you at the end of this discussion also to tell us how you see it and what AMCAO is going to be doing with all of this huge talent and thinking that is going on here in this room. Please, who would like to go first from the audience? Do I see any hands? Yes, please, over there. If you could give us your name and your organization, please. My name is Juan Antonio Sagardoy, and at the present moment, I'm with the Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, let me try to make a modest contribution to this meeting, which arises from the fact that I have been the project manager of an European project that was concerned with water, gender in the Mediterranean, and involved 14 countries and 18 organizations. So therefore, we have been going through the process similar to the one that is UNCO at this present moment going, and perhaps some of these experiences may be relevant to you. Let me first congratulate UNCO for this gender policy and strategy. Uh, I'm really impressed by the number of objectives um, that had been lined up for the future. I think this is the result of a long work. I understand three years of negotiations and work, which is quite impressive. By a comparison, I tried to get the water directors of the Mediterranean region just to endorse a statement about gender inequities into the Mediterranean region and we had quite a lot of difficulties in getting that support. So that shows, I mean, that <clears throat> there is a considerable progress and uh, a spectacular achievement in terms of defining the objectives for the future related to the gender strategy <clears throat> and policies. Um, let me just be more specific about indicators. Indicators. We have been... Very uh, briefly, please. Okay. Um, I'll be try to try to be very pleased, uh, very short. Uh, I would say that we need indicators at the national level. And for that, I mean, those that were presented by Ilaria Sisto had been uh, used in our project um, very successfully. I mean, I would suggest, I mean, to adopt some of them. Uh, they are just few but certainly they are necessary to give a national picture. But the real, the real issue that we are dealing here is about, I mean, identifying inequities in the water projects. And for that, you need much more the kind of indicators that were presented by Barbara von Koppen. I mean, that kind of indicators are very detailed and we need those to identify the problems in the, in the field. Actually, we do not need indicators. We need information that help us to diagnose the problems that we have there. And what we is really missing is not the <clears throat> information, but how to transform that information in action. And I found very relevant and very instructive, I mean, the presentation from the World Bank that has doing, been doing precisely that identifying some of the problems and doing some actions to correct that. So this is the second category of indicators we need. But uh, there is still a third category because indicators are about the progress in achieving objectives. And if UNCO has seven objectives to be achieved during a certain period of time, they will need also a set of indicators to see the progress that has been achieved or will be achieved in achieving those objectives that they have set. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. <laughs> Out.
Um, we have, I see two hands there. Could we have um, the lady at the back there, please? Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, the presenters. My name is Violet. Uh, she would say I'm one of the grassroots women leaders from Kenya who work mainly on agriculture, food security, and water and sanitation. I'm really impressed with the AMCO strategy uh, of uh, uh, ensuring gender equality. Uh, however, um, I think there is something that uh, I'm not getting out of this presentation, and that is how these indicators are translated to the grassroots communities, because when we look at um, uh, all these projects that we are talking about, the gender equality strategy, actually what is provoking us to speak about them is the issues that are at the grassroots. And usually, uh, most of these projects, who checks to ensure gender equality is being uh, achieved, it actually has been the externals or the the NGOs that are implementing. But it would add more weight when the grassroots women themselves understand what this project is going to achieve, participate in a meaningful way, uh, articulate, uh, so that they are able to actually keep checking and working to, to, to realize the same achievement that you are looking for. But when someone is implementing and then finally, or midterm, someone comes to check and say, what is it that we are getting? There is usually a gap. I think that takes us to what we call a meaningful participation of the women. These women that we, we are showing in photos, I think they are not just beneficiary like the photos are showing. These are the change agents in the communities and we need just to recognize and help them to understand the projects we are setting and so that they are able to actually uh, give, even the men that we are showing, they are, can actually support us like I saw the dialogue that was going on and I think there is something we should do more than that, especially when we talk of capacity building. Whom are we building the capacity? Is it the NGOs? Is it the governments? Or is there anyone doing, building the capacity of grassroots communities to understand the projects that we are setting, to understand what gender equality is. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this very pertinent question. Is there any of the panelists would like to respond to that? Yes, please, Alice. Well, thank you for that comment. I think that is precisely what the Women for Water Partnership is doing, because we are not an NGO, we are civil society, and we are those grassroots women. And I feel that um, maybe I did not make that very clear in my presentation because I skipped a few examples for sake of time. Um, but I feel that really uh, the best indicator of how it works is precisely what you are saying. If the women themselves are um, empowered enough so that they can engage. And um, actually in the examples that I can give you, that is exactly what is happening. And then you can skip a lot of the, the indicators because they bring them up themselves. The best way of gender mainstreaming is empowering the local grassroots women so that they have a voice when the process is running and when the project is designed. Not using them as beneficiaries, but as actual partners in the process. And that is exactly what I was trying to say in my presentation. And what is in the MCO strategy, uh, but what I missed in how the objectives are being translated into actions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I see the more hands going up. Yes, please, this gentleman. Thank you. Uh, my name is Stephen Donko. I'm from the UN Economic Commission for Africa. And first of all, I'd like to make two points. The first point is that I'm very impressed that uh, First of all, this decision of AMCA was made in 2003. I happen to be there. And I'm impressed that since 2003, it has made so much progress into a complete strategy. So I would like to congratulate AMCA for that. But in all the presentations I've had, in between 2003 and now, there have been so many meetings and so many discussions about how to translate it into practice uh, indicators and so forth. For the first time, to my a humble opinion, I had somebody who put a list of actually what's happening on the ground in many countries and which could probably give us 
the best and easily uh, measurable uh, route to developing indicators, how many women are involved, for example, in the sachet water industry in Africa. It's really happening everywhere. So Banchi, we'd like to work with you on that. Thank you. Okay, yes. Um, so we see, I have one and a second one there, please. Hi, thank you very much for the presentations. My name is Michael Davidson. I'm an independent irrigation efficiency consultant. My PhD is in public policy, and to a degree, this is really not a classic public policy issue, but there are policy tools, and especially Dr. Dick's presentation pointed out a very important policy tool in uh, policy evaluation and using the index. So I'd like to talk with you offline about that if I could later. But um, one policy tool that's been used very successfully um, in communities, let's call them underserved communities in southern Arizona and New Mexico and the United States, is called the ABCD. It's Asset Based Community Development. And I'm suggesting that it's got some built-in things for local community empowerment that might be very helpful here. Uh, very, very quickly, instead of going into community and doing, um, say, a needs assessment, you do an asset assessment. The asset is not a monetary asset. There are the talents and the, and the skills of people in the community. And generally what happens in this process is, um, and it's always women, in Spanish it's called the promontores. It's usually very popular in Hispanic uh, communities. Uh, and they are the people who are really more forthcoming, very charismatic women. They get trained and they turn around and go to the community and really identify the skills and tools and the people who have talents in the community and it becomes a community-based thing rather than a top-down. That's all I have to say. Good job. Okay. Thank you very much. So there we had two very different interventions. Um, from UNECA, we had a direct offer to work together with Bansi to, to develop this list of indicators further. I hope that there's somebody taking notes of these various suggestions. Um, can we see who is the rapporteur, please? Is ah, Bansi, are you rapporteuring? Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. Well, you're in the perfect position to do that then. Um, and then um, we've had a very interesting suggestion of, a, of a, another methodology in terms of, of looking at assets and, and the genderization of those assets. Um, okay, we, I see another hand over here, please. My name's David Wilcox, and my commitment is to be the non-policy guy. And the way I'm gonna be the non-policy guy is I'm gonna help with this woman's suggestion by Excuse telling- Excuse me, sorry, could, could you please tell us your organization? Reach scale, we advocate that governments and corporations scale social enterprises. So the, the on-the-ground request that uh, she made is actually being delivered by a large ecosystem called the social enterprise ecosystem. Mohammed Yunus calls them social businesses, and his quote in every speech is, when I found a problem, I started a business to solve it. So that's the social enterprise sector, and they're, they're the anti-policy people. They go and solve problems despite the policies, or they avoid even talking to the people who make the policies. So the way this translates in the water sector is that you take an organization uh, called the Blue Planet Network, which is a global water collaboration social enterprise that helps put local leaders together with water experts to actually do the water projects. And when you go to get the money to do the water projects, you tell people that after these water projects are done, the women will not have to go gather the water and they'll have time to do other more important things and the girls will be able to go to school. And that's always great and you can do the indicators to track that and then you can hope that that happens. What we try to do is find the social enterprise that is actually executing that on the ground so that you're not just waiting for the policy indicators to take effect. So I'm gonna use a Uganda example because our honorable minister is here, but there are examples like this all over the world. So the organization in Uganda that's delivering on that commitment happens to be 
way, way, way out of the mainstream. Eight hours from Kampala. Um, started by a, a man whose brother and sister died of AIDS and he inherited their chi children, but he happened to be in Michigan. And so he started going back to try to fix the problem. Anyway, long story short, what they've done now is they've actually found the asset-based solution for this problem, which is it turns out is the grandmothers who are raising these kids. And they've organized these grandmothers, there's six or 7,000 of them, in grandmother groups, and they use the asset-based approach by taking all the ideas they can pull together and then going to the poorest grandmother and beginning and working their way up through the group. So this organization of six to 7,000 grandmothers in these groups has created enough social businesses for the grandmothers that they have now been able to do the thing that was keeping the girls out of school, which was they couldn't afford to pay the school fees and buy the pencils. So they've now got enough money, they've got 25,000 children in school who wouldn't have been in school otherwise based on earnings of the grandmothers in social businesses that were started by these group brainstorming local efforts. There's 53 Ugandans that work for this organization, but they all work in the two schools they run. Three people, three Ugandan people, all women, I believe, run the entire grandmother program because they don't really run it. It's run by the grandmothers. It turns out these grandmothers are remarkably talented women who are able to do most of the work themselves. They come to training once a year and then they go back and implement it and share it with the other groups. So, you know, to me, you need that component to your strategy. And I, I'm not an expert on your strategy by any means, but you need that on the ground social business component to actually enable you to have the policy indicators be the results of those kinds of innovations on the ground as opposed to just hoping that it turns out that way. And that's just one example from Uganda of, of an organization that's doing that. I believe they were recently written up in a couple of the big newspapers there and they're starting to get some attention but most people never heard of them six months ago. Okay, thank you. So there's a bit of a challenge to the, um, to the view that what gets measured gets done and to try to have a more systematic approach to looking at these issues. Um, would any of the panelists care to respond to this gentleman or indeed to any of the views that, that have been expressed so far? Bansi or? Sure. <laughs> okay, first of all, that list which uh, Donko Mike Maxwell, uh, I presented there is a challenge in that um, is maybe where these indicators can also look at because uh, uh, you notice that a lot of the indicators were on water and agriculture and wash, but actually water is a business build those three domains and the list can go on and on, only that I thought it would tire the, the group. Now when it comes to this, uh, the story about the grandmothers, I was waiting to hear the water story in, in it because the, the, the Uganda I know is quite well endowed with the water. But the problem of those grandmothers is found elsewhere in Africa. Imagine that kind of problem in a country without water. So it, it is a very strong message, especially if you mix, because this is a water meeting, and water has to be fetched, sometimes from very far. Sometimes I know places where we count water in days, not in even hours, to go, like in northern Kenya, for instance. And those kind of issues are there of orphans and others. So it's a, a model that can be replicated with a water story inside it. I am not sure about whether that particular community underwater issue. Thank you. And one of the first things that Niaka did was they went and raised money to put in a water system. And they do get it from the river, which, which they can't access, but they've piped water to 60 different points 
across the, the, the core area that they serve, which are those the two villages and the two schools that they run. So they, they got water there. They don't do it for all the grandmothers, but other people are doing that. But th there, is a, there was a direct water example there, and then Blue Planet was looking for a way where they could do water and then have you know, an example of how you could programmatically have the water result in the kinds of outcomes that you want to measure. Okay, thank you. Um, would any of the other panelists like to respond, or, or Madam Chair, since, since this is your country, <laughs> Honorable Minister, would you like to take off your chair hat and, <laughs> and also make no, a response? I'd rather, I'd rather leave it to the technocrats at the moment. I'm just <laughs> going to put a general pitch, you know, overall, uh, my view overall. At the end, the good. Yes, thank you. On. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I see this. Alice would like to respond, please. Yes, I would like to respond in general with, with just one phrase. One does not develop people. People develop themselves. So I totally agree with you that if you um, give the people to, uh, the opportunity to bring out their strength, uh, then this will develop. And I think that is an underestimated precondition of empowerment. And you can concentrate on indicators, as I've said that before, which is very important. But usually what's happening in reality is that at the policy level, people make out, you know, there's emerging issues and there's all sorts of priorities. And then we start top down, we start doing the institutional mechanism, the legal frameworks and everything, and then we come to the indicators. And by the time it comes to implementation on the ground, there's a new priority and a new emerging issue, and we start all over again. So if you create an enabling environment by by making the bottom-up movement stronger, so strengthen civil society, and that's what the lady from Kenya also said, then whatever policy issue you address, you have the, the ability to bottom-up and top-down meet. And whether that is in the, the case of the grandmothers or in whatever um, opportunity you do that, the system works. So the best indicator for accelerating the implementation of internationally agreed water-related or non-water-related development goal is strengthening civil society bottom-up. Thank you very much. And yes, please, Barbara. Yeah, um, in addition to what's just been said, I'd like to add that um, beyond strengthening civil society and other external support, local women particularly are already doing things for themselves outside of um, you know, what's happening in the policy circles. For example, um, there are a lot of savings groups uh, for rural women who club together, save, and then they buy technology, um, such as um, water storage tanks, such as um, hippo rollers, and all those um, kinds of water devices and, um, yeah, conveyance mechanisms. So, yeah, I think the challenge is to support those initiatives that bubble up spontaneously by local women realizing that it is their hands that are burning and then doing things for themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I see a number of hands now popping up. Um, so yes, please remember that we're trying to now focus on actions and commitments. Please state your name and your organization. Yes, I see Bart at the back there. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening. I'm Bart de Vos. I'm president of the World Use Parliament for Water. And uh, on behalf of uh, that use network, I have a very short, but uh, for us personally, uh, important wish. And that is that um, work, uh, that um, gender networks and use networks work more close together and that we provide more uh, ways of exchange between the two because uh, we often have to face very uh, similar obstacles when we are working. And at the other hand, we also have very similar objectives. Okay, thank you. So that's the voice of the youth there, saying let's, let's gender and youth strategies work together. Um, I've seen, yes, please, this lady at the back. Yes, hello. Is, is it on? Yes. My name's Cathy Farnworth. Yes. Just a very brief comment and also commitments. It's talking to my colleague here at the back. 
I, I think it's amazing how you talk about the grandmother's project. What about the grandfather's project? Sorry, really excuse like me. Sorry, could you, could you tell us your organisation, please? I'm a private consultant on gender issues. Um, I really like the presentation from South Africa because you talked about men's gender needs in relation to water. And I think this is an issue that I see coming up again and again. Women are getting so much responsibility. Women are targeted all the time. Of course, it's very important to work with grassroots women and so on. But what about men's responsibilities? And Akini and I um, recently talked to the Men for Gender Equality Now network in Kenya. And that was really very interesting, working with very positive, very resourceful men. But they also talked about their challenges on working on all these different issues. And they're working for gender transformation. So I think it'd be really good as a commitment to find out what men are doing to support women in all of this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And this gentleman here. My name is Henk Holtslag. I'm a freelance advisor on low-cost water technologies. Uh, my commitment would be supplying knowledge on affordable water and sanitation technologies. Uh, with colleagues, we work in about 12 countries. We collect best practices on technologies that work, that are affordable, that can be produced locally, and which we see are quite essential. The technology choice often is uh, quite essential in the success of a project or a program. So what we can supply is knowledge on experience. We have most of our experiences failures. I mean, we have seen a lot of failures of things that did not work, but we see increasingly things that do work. And we have a stand in the corner of the booths, and people that have interest in low-cost technologies are very welcome to have a look there. Thank you. Well, thank you for that, but could you please tell us to connect to the topic of the, the seminar in terms of gender indicators? Have you looked at your technologies and whether they differentially affect men and women? Um, well, we see different effects. I can give a few examples. Um, we know, for instance, for irrigation, uh, they use treadle pumps. It's a, a, a pedal pump, which is quite famous in Asia. They also introduce it in Africa. But we know that in certain areas, women are not allowed or not supposed to walk or not to, to dance on a pump. So if you want to introduce this technology, you have to th take into account this, this, this condition. Because if women are not allowed to do this, you know, it's a wrong introduction. And, and the same, I have another example. For instance, I was last year in Malawi and we visited a project of 2,000 irrigation pumps that were given to farmers. And I asked, when we went to, the, to, uh, to this pump with a, a certain family, I asked the lady, can your husband show me how to dismantle and repair the pump? And she said, I don't need my husband, I do it myself. She took the pump apart in five minutes and put it together and it was repaired. She had the power over the technology. It was a rope pump, which is a very simple technology, and she had the power over the pump. Okay, thanks very much for that story. Yes, I see Mercy here would like to uh, respond. I, uh, I mean, just, to, just to mention that this session really is a session where we wanted to create uh, a forum to share the information that we have generated in our various institutions in the area of indicators. And we have had lots of experiences from the WASH program, for the multiple water users, uh, and concrete examples from the ground uh, as coming from the three discussions. What would be very interesting to come out of this meeting is a concrete way forward. We have had all these experiences and examples that have been provided. We have had the various partners and institutions with suggestions on how they have done things. We have started a dialogue. We want to move away from the approach that Stephen mentioned uh, when he made his intervention, where pronouncement had been made, but now because we have put indicators online, we want to be able to move. Where do we go from here? What are the concrete actions to take so that this meeting or this uh, session is not a session 
where things are left hanging. We want to know where to go from here. What does it mean in terms of the way forward? If we don't come up with this, the AMCAO strategy remains where it is. AMCAO is expecting a lot from us as partners in terms of supporting them to move forward. So my question becomes, where do we go from here? We are the partners who have participated in this session. What are the next steps? I mean, uh, what will IMI do? What will the water and sanitation program come up with in terms of the way forward? How can we work together with, with IFRI? How can we work together with PLUS? Where do we go from here? It cannot just end in by a three hour session. There needs to be follow up action. Where do we go? Thank you. Thank you, Mercy. Well, there's a call to arms. Do I see any of the panelists or other members of the audience want to respond? Yes, please. Working? Okay. Uh, my name is Francesca Greco. I'm the gender focal point of the World Water Assessment Program with UNESCO. Uh, please accept my apologies because apparently destiny was against me because <laughs> my office put four parallel sessions right now, so I was late. But answering to your question, um, from the 1st of September, <laughs> WAP will be committed to fundraise for sex disaggregated indicators in order to support AMCA gender strategy and every other institution who is interested in working on sex disaggregated indicators. I am under the UN water umbrella, so WASH and all other colleagues know very well what we are doing. So this is what we are doing. We are fundraising because one fundamental issue is where are the money going and money should go to women. That's my contribution. Thank you so much for that. World Water Assessment Program is going to be fundraising to make all its indicators gender sensitive. Is that correct? Is that what I'm hearing? Thank you for that. And we know that this is a massive uh, UN-wide uh, program that is also working on a lot of indicators, a large number of indicators across water in all its facets. I see a hand here, yes. Abby Waldorf, and I'm here with the International Water Management Institute, as well as the University of Pennsylvania's new journal on gender and water. And um, something that's become very clear at IMI and with this journal is that there needs to be a clear communications for development strategy. And something that the journal is trying to do, and I have copies here if anyone would like to see, our first issue came out in April. Um, but we're trying to, to take this discussion and continue it past forums such as this one. So we have a blog, we have a journal out and we're also planning a conference in April so we'd really like to continue this discussion both online and in conferences in person um, where we can have an entire conference instead of a three-hour session on gender and water an entire conference um, that's that's sectored out for gender and water um, so if you'd like to come talk to me I'd be happy to give you more information about it and uh, maybe we can de develop a communication strategy so that we can translate scientific research that's been done onto um, on the ground action Okay. Thank you very much. So we hear a space for communications on, on this vital issue. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, well, thank you very much. I, I would very much like to thank Messi for coming up with that idea because um, there's no doubt about it. The presentations were excellent, have therefore generated a lot of debates, and we could go all, all night uh, discussing some of the issues. Um, one, um, I'll point out that we need political will from respective governments in doing this. Brilliant ideas have come out of here. But for us to walk away out of this meeting thinking that we've agreed this consensus on how we're going to move forward, we've got to get, develop action plan. Uh, because even if we have the monies, all the monies tomorrow, without action plan, it, 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 Having de developed and uh, developed them in uh, the action plan in a comprehensive manner, in a manner that takes into consideration all these issues that that have come in, 
uh, I still think we will con continue to generate ideas, which is not bad, but it means everything remains on the drawing table until we meet next year. So I think it is important that we walk out of here with some action plan agreed on and probably attached to, or to that some time, time frame on what we need to do between now and probably the next meeting or uh, any other meeting that is coming in the near future. Thank you. Well, this is really a, a wonderful guidance from the Honorable Minister. Um, I like have a to name, it. it's Betty. Betty. <laughs> Rather than Minister, Minister, Minister. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we'll call you Betty. Um, I'd like to know from people who've been involved with the AMCAR gender strategy, and I know that Phoebe, uh, Simon, is there an action plan or an in implementation plan that is already been involved? Or is that yet to be done? I think uh, there is an implicit one in uh, chapter three of the, of the strategy. And that is what we are trying to see how to implement. Because there are so many different organizations. Some are in wash, some are in uh, food, some are in all different aspects of water management. So we are trying to see, can we develop a common set of indicators that the ministers and also the other people can use to report on progress in the countries. So it is, it, is, it, uh, it is implicit, but it's not clear. What are the metrics? What shall we use that is acceptable by the countries, by government, by NGOs, and so on? Right. Uh, the second thing I just wanted to give for information, between now and uh, in about three months' time, there will be this uh, freshwater conference in Natal. And at that event, we should have a side meeting on looking at how to progress this issue further. But in between, there should be quite a lot of build-up. And eventually, we hope that by next year, when we have this uh, big women's summit we are hoping will be held, I don't know where it's going to be, we can have some very conclusive set and we can start reporting on what is happening in the different countries. And I think Rosemary can help me on this also. Thank you very much. And then maybe I can also take my hat off and just to say that together with Mercy, together with um, a, a wonderful gender group um, that's working together with GWP, with regional focal points in all the GWP regions, GWP is developing its own gender strategy, trying to put its house in order um, and to, to really see what we are doing in terms of gender, what the network is doing in terms of gender, and then going forward to also resource uh, a, a research study on Africa that is geared to supporting AMCAR. But what I'm hearing is that there are a lot of resources to draw on now in designing that research plan. Um, I don't believe that the person who is leading that proposal is here, Eman Karar from the Water Research Commission in Southern Africa. Is she here? No, she's not here. But uh, yeah, I, what I'm hearing is that there are we could maybe look at partnering more closely to make sure that initiatives are coherent and going together. If there are other initiatives going forward as well, and we're hearing from WAP in particular that there's something going forward. Yes, Bansi, please. My, my own contribution for the way forward is uh, an example. You borrow the example of CADIP. I didn't see much evidence of the involvement of governments, so that the governments, the respective governments own this process from now on. Uh, Uganda is here, at least, but I'm not sure about your brothers and sisters, whether they are, they are all here. So in, yeah, so that the, the whole thing is embedded, the way we embedded the CADIP, which is agriculture, the same way. In fact, we, 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 most of our countries are quite doing gender stuff like um, um, uh, you know, allowing a uh, certain percentage of presentation in this and the other. So it will land on soft landing. But I think the government process should be the next way forward, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yes, and we have these two milestones in, at least in water, we have the milestone of the, uh, the International Freshwater Conference in November. Mercy? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to reinforce the point that has been made on the role of governments, as well as for us to be able to build on various initiatives 
that are already going on. If there are initiatives that are already going on and you would like to bring this to our attention, please do so. Uh, I would like to urge you to do so because in the context of Southern Africa, there is a group of committed institutions who have put their resources together and they are plowing on because they want to carry out research to identify the uh, various government policies and actions. They are interested to understand the extent to which these are actually uh, taking into account gender. There are also institutions and various gov governments, again, I am aware of governments in Southern Africa, who are coming together and they are already working and organizing themselves towards the Water Summit. If there are other initiatives that are going on, please let us know because we've got Barbara here and we've got other people here. We would like to know because then we can build on that. It's necessary for us to build on that because then it means we can work together in preparation for the Freshwater Conference as well as for the planned summit next year. So we need to know the initiatives if they are there. We don't want to talk in abstraction. We want to know what is there. Because if we live in abstraction, there is nothing for us to follow up on. And that would be unfortunate. Thank you. OK, so thank you, Mercy. So whoever has initiatives that they would like to um, have notified, please contact Mercy, who is a gender focal point in GWP. Um, Bansi, I gather, is also making a record of the commitments made in this meeting. So you have two people here. I'm afraid we're going to have to park it there because we're running out of time. But I would like to ask our panelists um, please to come back with a very short comment or commitment uh, that you'd like to reflect on for the end of this, this session. Ruth? Sorry, Ruth, would you like to start? Yes, please. Thanks. Oh, okay. Have to run back. So, then, yes. Betty? Would you like to then give us the closing words before we go back to our panelists? Thank you. Uh, I kind of have already said uh, what I wanted to say in my concluding remarks. That is the role of government, the political will. Uh, we can all have good intentions and do what it takes, what, whatever needs to be done. But if governments are not committed, not just committed, by word and uh, making declarations, like they, they all say the right thing and not take it to the next level, then uh, we're still going to be groping in the dark. So uh, given what has been said, I, I also hope that we'll come out very, very clearly on, you know, with, with benchmarks, what do we want to see respective governments do in the next so many years? Uh, two, what Mercy has suggested is good, but it still leaves things kind of hanging. If you have initiative, I think it, we should go beyond that. Could we, after this, assign maybe her and Dr. Batty, or, or even Rosemary, or, you know, I, we, need, we need men among us. <laughs> assign them specifically to follow up with the presenters, or even if you have not presented, but list of participants are available. You know, follow up with concrete actions, tell us what you have, give time, two weeks, three weeks, so that we all, you know, come out and say something. Then that will be compiled. And then, you know, we see what can be done. But if we leave it to if, we will not, we are not likely to see anything in the next, uh, there's got to be something to compel me, to drive me into giving this initiative, uh, f sending it forward. So we will also need your contacts, email addresses and, uh, right, email addresses basically. Thank you. <laughs> Betty, thank you so much for your guidance, that. your leadership. Can I, can I challenge you? to go back to your AMCAO colleagues and to say there is the intention to have this water, uh, Women's Water Summit next year. Mm -hmm. 
and what leadership is AMCAL taking towards that, and to give them the message that there is this very committed group of organizations all working together here to measure, quantify the issue of women and water in Africa. Please take that message back to your colleagues. But Absolutely. That's a done deal. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. It's really Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And this is yours. So, yes. can, I, can I just ask our panelists to give us one last closing word each, because I'm sure that you're still dying to respond so, to what you've been okay. hearing. Very hard to go after that, but um, I very much agree with the comment about asset-based approaches. A commitment I can make is that at IFPRI, we have a large program on gender and assets with lots of tools for measuring that. We, I heard about the AMCAO research component. We're prepared to help in any way you want on that research component, and particularly with methods of getting at the assets and the relation between gender and assets and how that affects empowerment of women in the water sector. Wonderful, thanks, yes. Yeah, I'd just like to reiterate the, the will of SCI to, to support the continued work, especially on, on the forgotten side of, of reuse, which links up to food security, which is the theme of this year. And we have an extensive network of partners in, in, in Africa who knows a lot about this, and we can draw upon them. Thank you so much. Barbara? Okay. Um, thank you. Um, within PLUS, um, we mainly do police-engaged research, and um, of late, we are finding the need to also engage more with civil society organizations. And um, we've already begun that. And hopefully, um, it is within that scope that um, we can find more scope to um, ensure that our research at least has the impact um, where it matters most. But um, what I'll take from here is um, some of the frameworks being pioneered, for example, um, the empowerment uh, domains, for example, the whole issue of assets um, ranking or, uh, or assets assessment, um, I think we'll take those on board and see whether in our research um, we can actually mainstream gender, because I think that is one missing angle. We, we, we work well on poverty, on livelihoods and all that, but I think as an organization, um, we will be working more um, on the gender gender front. Okay, Thank wonderful. You. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I also want to say if there are any f um, of the previous speakers in the previous session, if you'd like to reflect back very quickly. Alice, please, your yes, thoughts well, in one minute. The Women for Water Partnership has a very strong commitment on women's empowerment and furthering women leadership, especially bottom-up from the grassroots level. And, of course, we will continue doing that. We are very much um, think that demand drivenness is important, so we will ask our women what they think are valuable indicators um, when they think they are empowered. And of course, I've heard very well what all the different um, lists of indicators that have been um, uh, put forward to our attention, and uh, especially in the ones that Woods gave, there were a few that I thought they could be used as the questions that we ask, want to ask all our women. Um, but you can only do that if there's sufficient means to do it. And this is the real problem that women's organizations have. No money. Okay. So, so the, that's the, my basic indicator. Remember that. Absolutely. The issue of resources to fund all of this. And I can see that all of these networks and suggestions, at some point, they're going to end up in your desk, Phoebe. So we're, we're going to come back to you perhaps at the end. Bansi, do you have a quick... Oh, my. Okay. I can only add, because I thought I've spoken too much, much as we have looked at the grassroots... Please, we, we know that indicators is about science. So when we go there, remember to bridge the gap between the scientists and down to, to the grassroots so that we don't just go and miss some middle in the middle. Thank okay. you. Thank you for that wisdom. I can't quite see. Please. Uh, is that Ilaria? Yes, please.
Wonderful, thank you. So a commitment from FAO there. Is there, do you also want to speak? Oh, you're just standing. Okay. Um, Rosemary? Yes, please. said we would do is we would definitely support the research component of AMCAL strategy and the M&E component. And so uh, very, very interesting from Dr. Dick, uh, with Dick on the um, index and the tools that you have available uh, for perhaps the research component. I think we, we would want to consult with you on that. Um, and uh, when it comes to the m and &E, we will, as WSP, provide support to bring governments together, including ministers, to discuss and endorse the round of indicators that we've begun to discuss in Cairo uh, and, and come to some sort of a conclusion on indicators that countries can use to monitor their progress on gender in water and water for production. Now, the, the point that Bansi made, her presentation was a little bit overwhelming because she's gone to the entire spectrum of water in all its uses. And I, I don't know if we, could, we can do everything. I think you have to be able to decide and we have to be able to choose so that uh, we can do what, whatever we choose to do well and with detail and quality and that governments can endorse it and have the capacity to continue monitoring it uh, throughout their water sectors. Rosemary, thank you for that. Um, the issue of indicators inevitably raises a huge uh, uh, spectrum of possibilities and the question is then to focus and how to actually streamline the agenda that you're going to follow with the appropriate indicators. And I know we're going to be coming back to Phoebe at the end because AMCAO is going to be the last, but Mercy, please, before we come to Phoebe, would you like to comment? very grateful to FAO, we are very grateful to IMI because they made it possible for Bansi to attend this session. And Bansi, according to what we have agreed, will produce a report of this meeting. And within that report, we hope that the, she will have captured some of the indicators that will have come from here. That's point number one, that we can't run away from that. No, no. But from there, where are we going? From there, where do we go with this? It cannot just be a, a Bansi produced report that we will all go through and input to make sure that we have included all the aspects we have discussed. Where do we go from there? It cannot just be, we started in Cairo, I was not there, but that was the starting point. This is uh, stop number two. After here, where do we go? Thank you, thank you, Mercy. Uh, we all need to go off for the evening quite shortly, so, but can I ask Phoebe, as the AMCAO gender focal point, can I make an announcement, to reflect please? back on an, A small announcement. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very hard to catch all the nice things you have said, especially the way forward. Uh, please come for my card, that's all I can say, so that so, uh, some like Rosemary I have your contact, so that like, I can follow up and get the actual accurate information. Thank you. Okay, so please, everyone who wants to contribute, um, send an email or to Bansi, or contact her, get her card, get her card speak to her. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, Phoebe, please, could you reflect back for us? Now, how is AMCAO going to look to take this forward, knowing that you have so much support here around the room? Well, um, one, th one, the one thing I wanted to start with saying was that just to remind us all about the fact that this is very much, the AMCAO agenda strategy is very much a government document. So the involvement of governments, I can say, is already something that starts from the very beginning. It's not something we have to chase, but I think it is one thing we I haven't heard said so much is the Africa 
monitoring and evaluation and reporting process into which this will feed. Um, this is a system, the Africa reporting process is something that AMCAO is trying to establish to report on water and sanitation in general. And gender, the gender report will have to fit into that. At the moment, there is hardly anything on gender. When it started in the beginning, there was something, but along the way, it got dropped out. Um, now, the first report for, from AMCAO to the African Union probably will go out either November or early next year. Um, depending on how countries are report, responding to this request. But one thing I think that we should reflect on at the moment is what will this gender part of the report look like? I think uh, Masi was saying, what are we going to do next? I think we have to come up with uh, a kind of framework that will fit into this bigger reporting process. Um, the reporting process itself is very much something which is, um, let's say, a work in progress. And I think what, what should happen now is we should very quickly decide what is it that we want, where, or a deadline for getting gender into this process. Um, the m and &E Task Force, that is a, a big group of partners who are doing work on reporting in water and sanitation in, Af in Africa are having a meeting on the 29th in K15. Some of you may be members of this task force, but I think that if you're interested in knowing what is going on, some of you can, it's a whole day meeting. So you can go and observe this process and probably get some more insight in um, the kind of report that is going to go forward to the African Union uh, Heads of State Summit. So that's just um, what I wanted to talk about. Okay. Phoebe, thank you so much. So there is actually an existing AMCAO monitoring and evaluation process that all of this effort can feed into. Yes. What I'm hearing also is that it's very much water supply and sanitation related. So the sort of list of water resources related indicators that Bansi has been talking about, that is a lot of the work that has to be done to feed into this process. And so I would urge you all uh, whoever has the time on the 29th, is it, in, yes. in room K15, please to, to participate. So I see that certain people will be participating and feeding into that already. Thank you. So we have a way forward. We also have a milestone in that there is a women's summit that is being planned for next year. And an intermediate milestone is the November International Freshwater Conference in South Africa. With that, I'd like to say to all of you who have stayed the course, thank you so much for all your contributions. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>